Hey, aloha everybody. How you doing today? Welcome to another episode of Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. I am unfortunately not the Texar. I'm Andrew, the security guy here today. The Texar's uh, indisposed today is what I'll say. Uh, my co-host is here, Christine, the leadership gal. Uh, I think she's been on once or twice. And our guest, Shannon Eady, from Holomua, the president of Holomua Consulting Group. Um, today, we're going to get into how technology sort of impacted um, government contracting. So we'll talk a little bit of maybe transparency, privacy, and a little bit of a little bit of competitive research is easier. Some things about it now that I think will be uh, of interest to those of you out there. And you know, government's a big section of business in Hawaii. But the first thing we're going to do that we always do is uh, try to get to know our guest a little bit. So Shannon, talk us. You can start from birth, <laughs> like, <laughs> or, or you know, where, wherever you'd like to start. Uh, tell us a little bit about up, your background, where you grew up, where you grew up oh. and uh, take us through that a little bit. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for having me on the show. I really appreciate this opportunity. We've been trying to drag you on here for months, <laughs> but you know, thank you. I was born and raised in Hawaii. I left for college oh. when I when I graduated from high school. I went to the University of Puget Sound, where I received a Bachelor of Arts in Business, and then I moved down to California, where I went to Santa Clara Law School. Wow! All right, and, then you, and you you're one that came back though, so I we did. have the brain drain. But you're one that brought the brains back, so thank you. I did, but it t it did take me a little bit of time, so I actually practiced in San Francisco oh. in the Bay Area for a number of years before I returned to private practice here. Good. Well, I'm glad you're back with Holomua Consulting, and we'll talk about it. So where'd you go to high school? Where'd you, what side, where'd you grow of up? Whatever, course, whatever, the, the ultimate question, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody makes their associations, right? Yeah. Based on where you went to high school. Right. I went to Kamehameha School. Oh, awesome. Okay. So for, uh, it's because it's what, third, three to 12, or it's? It starts at kindergarten, so yes. K through 12. I'm, I'm considered a lifer. Really? So. How was that experience? It was great for me. I mean, I will admit that I actually didn't want to go there when I was in kindergarten. Ooh, so yeah. it's, this is, you know, people will see this. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, when you were in kindergarten. When okay. I was in kindergarten, I wow. wanted to go to the school down the street because I thought it would be fun to walk. Oh. So that was the only thing. What in my school mind. was that? I, I honestly, I can't remember <laughs> what school it was. You wanted to walk to school. So what, you had to take to. a bus. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. Who wants? What kid wants to get on a <laughs> bus at what at seven a.m. or whatever? Wow. Okay. So Kamehameha for life. And then did they, um, do they, they have some programs ongoing or, or still, I mean, are you still involved with Kamehameha? Because most of the people I, I meet that went there kind of keeps some involvement or had some involvement in their, their further education as they went on. And right. it's I a mean, great program it, over there. It is a wonderful program. I am definitely still involved. Good My deal. company is also, you know, remains very much involved with their programs. Oh, good. So they have a great internship program that they do every summer. And, you know, yes, a lot of the alumni are very thankful for the opportunities that Kamehameha presented to us. And for me personally, I, really, I received scholarships oh, through awesome. college and then law school. Awesome. So I definitely try to give back whenever possible. Good for you. That's amazing. And, and then you, so you came back and started Hobomua Consulting. So I, we'll take a look at something that we do. We have a little section called, you know, got one tech job. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a look at this real quick. And hopefully this was not a Kamehameha grad. I picked this up because it was a little bit of technology. So this guy tweeted out, um, hey, Ryan, we found two more four bottle packs of dogfish heads Midas beer, touch beer. When we drink, we do it right, get slizzard. So obviously he posted this on the American Red Cross's oh. Twitter feed. So okay. he, this is a guy like me who probably manages multiple feeds, and he probably had the didn't wrong mean to one. put that on that. So be careful with your technology um what you put out there stays out there much like this show is always going to be out there you'll be you know forever uh, alive on uh, youtube i'm curious if he still works there well i don't know ryan personally i just <laughs> got that as an example um of sort of like this this technology and transparency thing so um Holomu consulting you came back and so you you came back were you, were you here for a while before you started did you have the idea of getting your own firm going or well my business partner daphne tong pave and i we were actually working together at a defense contractor here okay. and through our work with this company we came to see notice that there was a need in the community for you know more advanced guidance in terms of federal contracting ah, and specifically when it comes to the small business contracting programs that exist in the federal sector so we ultimately decided to start our own company with the support of our employer actually so it worked out very well for us huh. and 
having Holomo Consulting Group allows us to help a wider array of small businesses. Sure, so sure. That's and really where our passion lies, and so we, we love what we do and being able to help small businesses. And you're, you're a, so you're a woman-owned business. Are you, do you have those classifications, like Christine's a woman-owned 8A, are you an 8A or an 8 point? Do you have some of those classifications yourself? Currently, we don't, except okay. for a woman-owned small business. Okay, awesome. And is that self-certifying, or how's that one work? I don't... As a woman owned, yeah, yeah, self certification. I'm curious though, you do have a foundation, is that correct? We do. Oh. We, we have a, it's called the Ho'okumu Foundation. It's still very, very new. You know, we're interested in economic development for the Native Hawaiian community. So we're still in the process of, you know, trying to develop our programs. And as part, I'm curious if part of that is, is from based on the changes in regulation with regard to Native Hawaiian organizations and the certification that's required moving forward. For us personally, it, it didn't have an impact, but there, you're correct, there are new regulations that the SBA has, has put out relative to the Native Hawaiian organizations. So we have definitely seen an increase in the interest level of uh, individuals and businesses that want to pursue that program. And to pursue that program, you do have to have a nonprofit organization. Awesome. I see. So are those typically set up? Are they to feed back to Native Hawaiian um, issues, Native Hawaiian populations? Is it specific how they give back or? The regulations are not specific okay. in terms of how the nonprofit organization should be giving back to the community. So it really just depends on the, non the specific nonprofit and kind of what their interests are and how they can see themselves best contributing to the community. I see. But and then you demonstrate it with some, some metrics, some, some financial metrics or something. Or right. Generally speaking, it is in terms of financial. Mm -hmm contributions to the community but there are some nonprofits that have specific programs and I do believe that their metrics would involve how many individuals they are oh, able to reach. I, I, like, uh, so I remember we talked to member Forrest Rizal who's been on our show by the way he has a one Purple Maia and he was looking I think you hooked him up with some mm -hmm. some organizations that needed to do some donations or, or was looking for someone to donate to or a program. Or, exactly. And that's amazing. You know, Forest's program is, is Purple Maya is a really great program. And, you know, when you introduced us to him and we were able to kind of speak with him, it really resonated with us. And we felt that it would also resonate with some of the, the Native Hawaiian organizations that we work with. So, mm -hmm. yes, the Native Hawaiian organizations can form their own programs or they can sub financially support mm -hmm. other organizations like Purple Maya. Wow. Do they do things like, because you, you have a, a foundation that you're a, on a board of from um, AFC or? Yep, or, AFC Foundation, Education Foundation. Is it a similar type organization or does it have nothing to do with the like Native Hawaiian? It's a similar in the sense that it's a foundation and their whole purpose in life is to kind of give back to the community, but it, it just differs in terms of the programs. Okay. I think that the value for the Native Hawaiian organization foundations is that they truly give back to the Native Hawaiians. I'm sure there's a bunch of programs that they do that people aren't even aware of. And they're more like usually scholarship, education, they're not, like there's not like building housing or, or are they, or I just don't know, like what's the range, what's the range you've seen? Maybe that's a good question. Yes, I think there are a number that do provide scholarships. I think because of the nature of the business that they're in, they try to support STEM education. Sure, sure. So th there are, you know, graduate level scholarships for that. And then, you know, um, Purple Maya kind of falls within that, but at a lower age level. Mm -hmm. So I think that fits in nicely. Yes, there are other organizations that focus on trying to help Native Hawaiian entrepreneurship. Okay, and sure, we need that in Hawaii. Exactly, yeah. and then I know that there's another organization that focuses on uh, education in middle schools in terms of technology, okay. and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I was meeting, met with um, Jeff Bloom and Dave Stevens from KCC just yesterday talking about how do we how do we get technology, you know, into the, the at the high school level? How do we pick these kids up a little bit sooner? You know, and uh, before they become hackers, right? You know, right. I mean, that's kind of our, where our discussion was going. And there's a lot of efforts, and it seems like there's not a lot of coordination sometimes amongst these groups in Hawaii. And, and you know, there's there's funds and there's programs and there's folks that are trying to, to give and, and looking for things to give to. But uh, it's not like it's not driven very well. Um, it seems like you know, there's no roadmap, maybe right. for example. But I think I don't think that that's a, a problem that is limited to Hawaii. I think oh, it's I see. Just generally speaking. It's difficult for nonprofits to kind of work together and 
just because I think people have their own ideas about how they can benefit the community. And so sometimes mm, if their ideas or their programs don't necessarily gel with someone else's, even though maybe they have the same goal, mm -hmm. you know, they still want to pursue their own route. Mm, I see. Interesting. And is that, is that something you guys struggle with at your foundation as well? Is it purely it's, scholarships? It's purely or? scholarships, specifically in the STEM field. But, I mean, we still have difficulty fulfilling those scholarships or finding students that are capable of fulfilling those scholarships because it could be specific to STEM. We have one that's very specific at a master's and PhD level for cyber oh. that they couldn't actually give the money away. It was three thousand dollars of free money that they couldn't find someone to give that money to mm. so um, or it could be specifically related I know a lot of the FCA um, scholarships that are given out are also specific to students in Hawaii right and so making sure the money kind of stays here um, but that's not necessarily easy to fill and it, it becomes more of I think of marketing thing where you got to get the name out there you got to get the information out there you got to get the, a bunch of students who are interested and, and I think for, for us it's more of a disconnect between us and the students is how do we get everybody together mm -hmm. right how do the students become aware of the scholarships that are available out sure. there. I would imagine, I don't know if it's easier with Native Hawaiians just because, you know, you have Kamehameha schools, right? And, I mean, you kind of know where the Native Hawaiian students are going, or at least a large majority of them, but I don't know if that necessarily makes it any easier. Yeah, do they spearhead that? I mean, do they, was there a lot of information as you're, like, I guess, graduating from your 12th grade, or are they programs there to, f to feed you into the, to make you aware of all this the help that's available or well I did graduate from high school I don't want to date myself but it, it was, <laughs> it, was quite a a while. <laughs> it was quite a while ago but you know when I was there we there was a lot of information I see that was put out and I should guess us. that's grown mm -hmm. um, it, obviously, do you go back and do that is that part of do you deliver some of these messages because you know these groups that are wanting to help or, or is that I definitely do it informally. I okay. don't actually, you know, have a formal do it formally. But yes, informally, I always am trying to make, you know, students that I come into contact with aware of all of the scholarship opportunities that are available. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's um. So, Holomua probably wasn't started with that idea. You had a you have a business plan. But it seems like you're doing an awful lot of community service to me. Well, I think Daphne and I both are really you know, intent on giving back to our community in whatever way possible. So, you know, definitely we're trying to run a business, but at the same time, we want to improve our community and we see economic development as a big piece of that. So actually, I think this conversation is, is really kind of interesting because one of the things that our nonprofit really wants to focus on is how to make sure that we, I don't necessarily feel like we should keep all the talent here, mm -hmm. but how do we make it easier for them to come home sure. when they're oh, ready? Let's, because that's, let's grease the skids, yes. whatever it takes. Yeah, I'm with you. That's a great focus. You know, we need that. There's a, I think there's a lot of kids that want to come home. Their families here, things like that, and uh, you know, they need a, a good wage rate. We've had all those right. discussions where there's, you know, the money's not the same. It doesn't work the way. You know, the same salary there here just doesn't. You can't get a house. It or, could be something as simple as just a lack of jobs, more so than the the money that they'll earn. I think for a long time we just haven't had the technology jobs, and I think it's slowly starting to rebuild yes. with the focus on technology, cyber. A lot of the stuff the HVCA is doing um, with regard to bringing venture capital in here for potential technology startups, and I, that's really, if you look about, it, think about it, it's only been in the last five to ten years. Prior to that, there wasn't really a technology focus for Hawaii. I think we were still kind of stuck in the agriculture view, right? I mean, so I think just in the last five years, it's really changed quite dramatically with regard to having technology available, technology jobs available here in the state of Hawaii. So. Okay. Well, we will. Um we're going to take a break and pay a few bills. I think this is a good time to stop. We're definitely going to get into this technology discussion in the contracting space. But, um, you know, if you're an 8A out there, you're Native Hawaiian, you want to figure out how to help the community out, call Holomua Consulting. we got uh, uh, Shannon Eady here today to uh, share some of that information. Uh, they're doing a lot of great work over there. Um, let us take a, a, a quick break. Uh, we'll be right back uh, with Shannon Eady, and we'll talk about technology and government contracting. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil 
my job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. Hey, welcome back to Hibachi Talk. Andrew, the security guy's here. I've got Christine Lang, the co-host. She's Christine, this is the leadership gal, I think we <laughs> called her. And we're here with Shannon Eady from Holden Blue Consulting. Uh, i got a quick security minute for you, though. I want to talk a little bit about two-factor authentication. Uh, if you don't know what that is, just think about the fact that when you go to an ATM machine, you put your card in, and then what? you got to do something else. you got to put in a PIN code. So that's a form of two-factor authentication. That's something that you have, which is the card, and something that you know, which is that PIN number. Um, we're going to show you a quick site for a site that I found called um, um, Turn, Turn, Turn It On is the name of the site. You can go to this website and you can plug in your credentials or a, a website that you go to, maybe it's LinkedIn or whatever, and you can, they have the instructions there for how to turn on two-factor authentication for any website that you use. And this will give you more security for your credentials. Um, uh, and you know maybe it's gonna it's gonna te uh, send you a text that you can use to confirm that it's you logging in. But that way we'll pre prevent someone from maybe hijacking uh, your credentials. They lo looked over your shoulder while you're in the coffee shop, um, whatever it may be. But it, it's a way to guarantee that it's you that's logging in. So take advantage of two-factor authentication anytime you get the opportunity, um, and you know it'll secure your world a little bit better. So. We're going to talk now, we're going to try to shift just a little bit and get into the technology of government contracting. And I think two-factor uh, is a great kickoff to that. Um, I don't use a lot of the government contracting sites. I know we have some, some staff that do. Um, but I was thinking, that, for instance, like the wide area workflow that we didn't, I'm not sure how old that is now, maybe 10 years. But does it have that type of stuff? Does it know our people are logging in? This is how you get paid by the government, by the way. Um, and it's really seamless, you know. It's a, when we first started our company, 20 years ago, you, you didn't know who was paying you. It was hard to hunt these people down. Today, uh, this, this process of submitting for payment is all tracked, and it's, there's a lot of transparency and visibility. Does it have some authentication when you log in, or is it still just email and password? That's a great question. It is still just email and password, as far as I know, for WAWF. And it's actually been around a lot longer than that. Than that. I'm pretty sure it's been around since the inception of our business, probably about Oh, maybe we years. just weren't in it. I just don't or, think a lot of people used it back then. Back oh, then, see. it was kind of like you could submit invoices you know, just mail them or send them through into, email. Into the versus, government. Yeah, but now it's a requirement, correct me if I'm wrong, oh, the it's a requirement for? that you use WAWF. So, yeah, and that's just a way to submit your invoices and get paid for it. So in, in the companies that come to you that need help, are they, do you have to advise them they need to know a little bit about technology just to get involved with government? I mean, is that a thing that you come across? Well, we definitely have to have that conversation sometimes, mm. especially for the less experienced contractors. But most of it initially comes in terms of internet access okay. and how to go about initially maybe doing research, market research, okay. on how to do business with the government. And how do you think that's changed? I mean, you know, there wasn't much transparency on all this when I was trying to do that work. You know, it's been quite a while back now. It's, I think it's changed. What's your, what's your feeling? Well, you know, before we, we came here today, we were just talking about, since I've been in the industry, obviously, you know, the internet has been in existence. And I can't imagine how contractors <laughs> operated before the internet. But I believe that it has really kind of, the increased transparency has led to a lot of good things. It has also led to an increase in competition amongst contractors just because everyone now has access mm. to the same information. Okay. So it, it has opened a lot of doors for people, but I think most importantly, from the contractor perspective, it has allowed contractors to really put together a strong strategy mm -hmm. when it comes to gotcha. pursuing and performing on government contracts. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll see there, if I can, I'll see if I can add some, st some, yeah. some, some, some interesting information to that. So if you think about it, I mean, anybody can have a website, right? Anybody can go down to the State Department and get a business license. To do government contracting, you don't have to have a contractor's license. You basically just have to be listed in SAM. But anybody can do that is what What's I'm saying. Sam? So SAM is the government um, 
database of businesses that do work okay. with the federal government. Yeah, just government. For, our, for our public. Yeah, so, so you list all of your information, what type of business you are, but my, I guess my point is, is you, you don't necessarily have to have an office. You don't necessarily have to have employees. You can be pretty much anywhere in the world and still be able to compete at the same level that established businesses who compete in the federal government space mm. do. And I think that's the challenge, right, is I would imagine as a contracting officer, you, you, you get, you know, six, you know, bid responses. You don't really know the difference between A, B, C, D, E, or F. Because they all look good on paper. Right. right. They could all have a website. They could all have, you know, a great mm. bio of, you know, people who work there and, oh, and, 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 and you, know, in, you, you know, legitimate, maybe not legitimate information, but you don't know. And I think that's what's made it more complicated over the last several years. Mm. Well, we're probably more than that. Probably the last 10, 15 probably, years. Yes. Yeah. So is there, do you, so I, I saw, I think your point was you could sort of research what successful companies have done and then emulate that path right, to, to getting involved with, with something or to compete with them even, for example. Um, their award information is, th is there. Now, not necessarily the way they build their bids, or, or is, that, is that public once it's been won, well, perhaps? Absolutely, you know, you can get more information now on your competitors and certainly on specific contracts and specific contract actions. Mm. So I think, you know, that's, that's definitely very helpful. In terms of proposals that have been submitted, yes, you can submit a Freedom of Information Act request or FOIA request, and mm. now you can do that online. Oh. So in the past, you know, it would take a, a really long time for you to do the request, mail it, have them receive it. And I think now that it can be done electronically, it does cut down on some of the, the time that you can, uh, it takes to get some of these, this information. Mm. However, the proprietary information will be redacted from I whatever see. you receive. I see. So that's going to include mm. pricing and you know, anything that mm. the company has labeled as proprietary. Yeah, you still might get to see they'll build build the way they built a, a mm -hmm. bid response, for example, all the items that yes. the, you know. So you now now get an example of how to build one that's similar or competitive. So I would imagine so it gives you give Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, is now right. online. And I would imagine that it gives you the ability again to kind of do all that, like she was speaking about earlier, is all that market research in the beginning to kind of know what that particular market is, what that particular government agency is buying, how much they're buying, what contracts vehicles they're using all of that information is available to mm. anyone so so but it's the if the FOIA is only pertinent to the government I can't request information from you there there may be times you can't request it directly oh. but through a FOIA request to a specific agency they may then have to come to the contractor Ooh. for specific information wow they may also before they send something out ask you to review it just to make sure ah. that, that you're okay with it. So Interesting. you can't FOIA something directly from yeah. a company. Yeah, like we found, I said, Kirstie, how much you make, you know, just, <laughs> right. just send me to make sure I make it the same. <laughs> the, uh, okay, interesting. So, so transparency in the contracting process, it sounds like there's technology has leveled that playing field quite a bit for those willing to do the research. Now, I'm going to guess that this is not simple research because I know these are two pretty smart, very smart ladies, let me say that. And so when you guys are doing this research, um, what's, a, what's, a, what's a typical kind of thing someone would have to, how much time would someone spend trying to learn about a competitor, for example, would you advise them? I would say it could take quite a while. I think there is definitely some translation and interpretation that has to mm -hmm. go on. I see. Some of the websites that we use to do our market research are not very intuitive mm, and sure. the information that you get back is very confusing especially if you don't know the terminology or mm -hmm. how to read things I see. so it can it can take a little while for you to understand things and and because not everything is centralized on one website or one location you may find yourself having to pull information from a number of different websites mm, I see and so let's, let's flip it a little bit and think of what about the privacy side of it so government now can't really had its problems, if we would call them that. Bought a $800, like when I was in the Navy, we bought $800 hammers. Remember these days? I had some of those. those they worked like my $2 hammers, by the way. But we had, you know, plenty of them because it was the Reagan days. The Navy was well funded in those days. Um, what is what has technology done on that side of the house? I mean, do you think it's, has it helped like the waste, fraud, and abuse programs? Are those better managed? I mean, you know, the more more tattle, tattle, tattle not tattle tales, but what do they call them? The you know you can send. We said type inspector general. You can send information right. to. Um, 
to expose fraud and stuff like that. What's your, what do you see there? I mean, my sense is that technology has really cut down on fraud, mm, waste, good. and abuse. You know, probably not to the extent that that we as taxpayers would like. Mm. But yeah, we want I, zero. <laughs> we want zero, by the way, if you guys are watching out there. But from, from my perspective, I think that it certainly has, has cut down. I think now, you know, whenever something happens, it gets publicized everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so now just more people oh, social are media, aware. Exactly, for sure. yes. Mm. So I think from that perspective, you know, it's it has had an impact. On the government side, you know, they, they certainly have their own share of, of problems with privacy. Mm -hmm. But I think with the internet, with social media, I think those concerns have had to, we've had to adjust, I mm. think, in terms of... Our filters. Exactly. Do you think we expect more? Do we expect to know more and have access to more? I mean, I feel like I do. I, 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 want, I don't know if what I'm getting is true, but I'm, I'm, I expect to be able to get this information. I don't think it's, it's should be hidden. Well, I would imagine it changes the whole way you do business. It probably changes the way that you market to the government. I think before it was very relationship-based, right? So you would go out and you'd meet the, with the contracting officers or the small business liaisons or potentially the end user to whoever you were selling to. But now it's much more about that market research and understanding what are these agencies buying, who's going to buy what I'm selling, right? That's much more important. That research is much more important than it probably was 20 years ago. Uh -huh. So knowing, and it's important to know that because you could essentially get in an industry where I, 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 I'm sure you've heard this uh, numerous times where people say, hey, I want to get into government contracting and what they do, the government doesn't buy. <laughs> and, and, That's and a it's, problem. It's amazing how many people think that the doing business with the government, getting a particular certification um, to do business with the government is, is, a, is a way to get a lot of money out of the government, and that's not necessarily true. If anything, just in our particular business, knowing that we do commercial work and government work, I actually think the government work is much more difficult and much more tedious, mm. because even though the information is there, that just means you have to do more and more work because all of your competitors are aware of that information too. Wow. And it's all in the up and up. You can't, you can't schmooze your way into a particular customer. It's, they, they, they have a requirement to make sure that they're treating everyone very fairly wow. and making sure that the bid process at the end comes out appropriately. And so I would assume that bid protests have increased <laughs> exponentially. Bid protests have increased, actually. I just saw an article that since 2009, there's been a 60% increase Ooh. in bid protests. Now, the, there hasn't necessarily been a corresponding increase in successful protests, mm -hmm. but... Just flagrant or, or uh, what do they call them, unsubstantiated or whatever. Well, not necessarily unsubstantiated, but actually there has been the number of protests that have been sustained or, you know, basically successful doubled since last year. Wow. Which, it's still not a huge number, but it does show that perhaps the protests are not necessarily, you know, frivolous. Mm. But as Christine mentioned, having all this information accessible to you, to us on the internet, does make bid protests more um, likely. I see. Yeah, and one of the examples I had, had talked to Christine about was if you don't get a contract and you have questions about the company that did get it, you know, you can look them up and perhaps they have some representations on their website that they're affiliated with a larger business. Mm. Well, that is a basis for a size protest. I see. So. All right. So if you want to learn how to do government business right, make sure you get a hold of Shannon at Holden Wood Consulting Group. Uh, they know what they're talking about over there. Um, that's all the time we've got for today. Thank you so much, Shannon, Christine. Thank you for being here. Thanks, everybody at Think Tech staff. Appreciate it. And um, we will see you again. I think Gordo will be back next week uh, on Hibachi Talk. So aloha, everybody.